Father, we thank you that there is a wonderful realm of heaven that's eternal, unending, unlimited. Hallelujah. Father, we pray that every person's eyes would be open to recognize all that you've done for us, this access that you've given to us, that we may interact with the, the living God, though, though invisible to our eyes right now, yet we can experience your presence in such a way that we're filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Though whom now we see him not, yet believing. <laughs> We have joy unspeakable and fullness of glory. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, I, I, want, I want you to know that there is a joy that exists. It's not pretend. You don't have to make believe. Now, under the law and in legalism and other religions, they have to kind of Fake laughter. You know, you can tell when somebody's faking a laugh. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Can you tell? <laughs> that is not a fake laugh. <laughs> and that isn't because I find anybody funny <laughs> or humorous. It's because of one, the wonderful presence of Jesus. <laughs> Wherever the Holy Spirit is, he produces love. He produces a love that goes far beyond the, I mean, love feels good in whatever form, you know, but love that God produces goes far beyond anything that men have ever experienced in a natural realm. And the Holy Spirit produces a joy. Ha. And that joy, oh my, my, my. We want everyone to come to know that joy, the joy of the Lord. The scripture says that because Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, the eternal Word of God, who was incarnated and we, whom we all celebrate His birth on the 25th of December, when Emmanuel came, God with us, because He loved righteousness and hated iniquity, God has anointed Him with the oil of joy. Hallelujah. The oil of gladness. Amen. That's what the Lord puts on our, on our lives. He puts, the, the scripture says, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing and design everlasting joy shall be upon them. Upon their head. It's an anointing. That's where the anointing comes. An anointing is a special interaction with God where he gives us the capacity and the ability to know him and interact with him. Some people... their parents were, who their parents are. They're born with wealth. They're born with prestige. They're born with the ability to achieve great things because of their network, what we call the rite of passage in some respects. Things that by and large 200 years ago was not known to the general population in any moment. There was no open door for that. Democracy in the United States of America brought an opportunity for people to be able to go beyond those limitations that by and large have existed since, uh, uh, in, in, you know, known history, since, since men have been writing down what's been going on in the earth. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? You don't understand that? You should understand that. Otherwise, you may actually fail to realize what kind of freedoms and opportunities have been granted to you because a bunch of people got together hungry for the things of the Spirit hungry for religious freedoms and came to the United States of America and started a nation. I don't need anybody to tell me my history. My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents were a part of this. You understand me? And people in modern day, you know, because what's going on, Satan wants to tear down every good thing that he possibly can tear down. Today in modern day, it's all a spin and one always talk about all the bad things that were done because there were bad things that were done. There was always evil men present. You may be seated. Do you know that? Anybody, anybody fail to realize that there's always evil men present? Hey, anybody fail to realize that there's always evil men present? Did anybody, did anybody notice that there's no evil in the world? Did anybody notice that? Would you raise your hand if you noticed that there was no evil in the world? Huh? 
So I see no hands coming, going up. People are evil. Are you evil? I'm just asking you I'm asking a question. Are you cantankerous, argumentative, huh? Causing problems everywhere you go? Are you listening to me? Because all that happens is it becomes, it just goes to different levels. You see what I'm saying? It starts off just an argument and for long people are basically, you know, killing each other. There's evil in the world. But there's also good in the world. And the only place you're going to find good in the world is among God's people. I mean, the only place you're going to really find good in the world is among God's people. Now, 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 I realize that Paul said in Romans chapter 2, and I believe it is verse 15, that if the Gentiles do that which is right, it's a proof that there is a law written upon the tables of the heart, written upon the heart. Yeah, see, the reality of it is, is all men were created in the image and likeness of God. God formed them, shaped them from the dust of the earth. There's more proof for that than there is for evolution. There's more proof for that God created all things that we see right now than for the ideas of a Big Bang Theory and whatever other theories you want to go along with. There's a big difference. There's a huge gap between that which is theoretical and that which is empirical. Theoretical is what you assume might have happened at some point in time and you use certain evidence to try to boister that idea. Empirical is where you got right in the big middle of the reality and started trying to work with the program. Are you with me? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. God has, you know, we read, for example, Romans 120. You can, you know, I have the word written on my heart, but you can look in the Bible if you don't have it there. If you don't know what, I'm, if you, please refer, make sure that I'm telling what's right. Who knows what's going on around here? <laughs> You're right. Who knows what's going on on the radio and on the television, on what Uncle, Uncle Holy Joe said and, and Grandpa <laughs> wasn't anybody better said? Because you might be leaving something that's not even true. He might be telling you a lie. You're just gullible, just believing it, just believing it. It's amazing how people just believe stuff. It is amazing to me. You ought to go search it out. You ought to go search it out. You ought to be of a noble type of a personality. He says, you know what? I, I heard that and it sounded right. I felt something with it. But I'm going to go make sure that it's right. I'm going to make sure it's true. Because your life, your, the, whole, the, whole, the whole possibility of being blessed and living in the presence of God versus living apart from God in a place called hell, separated from God for all eternity is at stake. Huh? Most people aren't going to risk the livelihood of their next meal and, and the place to stay and, 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 you know, clothes for their body and provision for their children. They're not going to risk that. They're going to make sure that they, they, that they wisely pursue the things they're necessary to do in order to be able to have what it takes to, to take care of the things that you have to take care of on a daily basis. Well, how about your soul? You can play Russian roulette with your soul. You can play a guessing game with your soul. You can play a game of imagination with your soul. Who are you going to trust in? The guy who's in the who's who group in genetics? Who are you going to trust in? Your favorite professor at the university? Who are you going to trust in? Your favorite teacher in elementary school? Who are you going to trust in? Your own ideas and imagination? Who are you going to trust in? God created a means by which you and I would have access into the most wonderful, lavish provision that could possibly be ever imagined. God made provision of that great expense to himself. And look in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Just look at that for a second. You know, is everybody looking? First time I've been to microprint Bible. <laughs> yeah, this is microprint. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I can actually read that. What kind of Bibles do you have? What kind of Bibles do you have here today? Huh? Any of you got a holy Bible? Anybody have a holy Bible? Consecrated words. Yes. God's words. And what translation do you have? It doesn't really matter. You're going to basically get the right one right here. Huh? Whatever you're reading. You ain't going to leave anything out. Some of you have, you know, yeah, New King James Version. 
I, I guess I have the King James version, version here. It says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that nobody's without excuse. No one's without excuse. Father, in all of his goodness and all of his mercy, has done everything he possibly can to open up our eyes to see the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And you know, Romans 1.18 leads the way in it. It leads the way into this verse of Scripture which describes the wrath of God that be revealed from heaven against all those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Everybody knows what the difference is between right and wrong. Everybody knows that there is something evil and that there is something good. Everybody knows that there is something that causes joy and there's something that causes sorrow. Everybody knows that there's something that causes love and something that causes hate. Give me a break. All of these crazy philosophical ideas that want to create a nihilistic world where there's no right, no wrong. And Father defines for us everything that is good and everything that is wonderful. Moses was able to see it when he stood there before the presence of the Lord and he saw the Father. He saw the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who shaped us and formed us in his image and in his likeness and breathed into our nostrils the breath of life and made us a living being. Hallelujah. <laughs> the breath that you draw, there's breath that, the breath that you draw, no man could put that breath within your nostrils. No man, nor will any man ever be able to put that breath in your nostrils. We may be able to understand scientifically, physically how it works, but nobody can reproduce it. It's something that belongs in the framework of the miracle of life. The miracle of life that we see when a child comes into this world declares to us the miracle of life that God himself brought forth when he shaped man from the fine dust and created him in his image and his likeness. Somebody said, what does God look like? Look around. Look around. The invisible things right now that we cannot see are clearly revealed by those visible things that we can see. Men want to try to talk about how big the universe is. That is the biggest joke I'm at. You talk about, you talk about humor. <laughs> you talk about humor. That is funny. And so they, they speculate how big it is and they polish the lens of the telescope. They create what we call a more powerful photo multiplier tube. They may look out into the distance beyond the distance because at some point they're going to be able to find that, 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 that moment where it all began. But it keeps getting further and further out there. It's like that rainbow we chased when we were little. Huh? It just, it just looks like it's right there, but it just keeps getting further and further and further and further. And there's no catching. <laughs> See, reality of it is, is true investigation, sincere investigation in the pursuit of truth will always bring people to a place of, of, of reality. But you just don't have that much time. You don't have time to wait till mankind explores the universe and finds out that there is no outer envelope, no edge. You don't have time. It's going to take a while to figure all these things out. Your life is but a hand breath in length. It's like a hand breath. That ain't very, it's like the length of a hand. It's soon, no sooner does it appear and it's gone. It's like the early morning dew on a hot day. You got to get re up really very, very early in the morning to catch it. 
because it's soon gone. That's our lives. And Father has come with many witnesses. He's come, he's come in invisible realms. Up into the time that Christ Jesus, who is, the invi who is in every way the express image of the invisible God. And you read in Hebrews 1, 3, you open your Bibles there. How many of you are going to get baptized today? I'm taking people to the water and we're going to get you baptized. We're going to dunk you. I may hold some of you down a little bit longer than others. <laughs> Don't fight it. We won't let you drown. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Only a few people were allowed to see Father, whom we call the Lord. After that, Adam walked away from God and transgressed against God and decided he was going to go an evil way. He made that decision on self-interest. He made that decision under the influence of someone who hates God. Is there a battle? Is there a war? Is there a reality between good and evil? There absolutely is, and nobody can deny that. And by and large, it comes out of an invisible realm that no one can fully quantitate outside of that which is manifested in a human being's life. I could talk to you about the invisible forms that we now have discovered over the past 100 years. Now chemistry is no longer an esoteric science and everybody's bowing down to chemistry. Five, 60 years ago it was esoteric science. Now, it, it's, now it's like the, the, the foundation of what we think and believe and do because we're able to work with it and find out, you know, uh, causes and effects of things. When you talk about the atomic world, subatomic world, when you talk about all of these invisible things like electrons that give us those, that light right there and the events that take place at that filament on that light bulb that creates a quantum of energy that we call a photon, which, which the, the, the concepts beyond the physical, the physics of quantum mechanics and, and the dynamics of photonics that express What's going on there is really wild ideas. But now we know, we know about things over the past hundred years that for 6,000 years men didn't know anything about. And as we continue to go on, we'll discover more and more invisible things that result in all the visible things that we've come to take for granted. And then out of that invisible realm, we have explanations and cures and, and we have ideas and theories. But reality of it is, it's still a much bigger picture. Paul said, by the Spirit of God, everything that's visible comes from an invisible realm and is produced by an invisible realm, is quantifiable by an invisible realm before people could even imagine what we're talking about today. And it goes beyond that because everything right now consists and has its being and substance by Christ Jesus who holds all things together. In Hebrews 1, 3, he is the express image of Christ Jesus. The express image of the Father who upholds all things by the word of his power, by whom also he made the heavens. And reality of his universe, also, if you could be able, if you could really be able to quantitate the universe, it's unlimited because of the expression of him. He didn't start a hundred billion years ago. He didn't start a hundred trillion years ago. He didn't start a hundred quintillion years ago. <laughs> he started long before that. Yep. And crea huh? And creation, my goodness, is an expression of who he is. 
if people would really understand the advancement of science so-called and their pursuit of truth and the things that they've discovered that has never trickled down to the elementary school level, that hadn't trickled, trickled down to the junior high school level yet, hasn't trickled down to the high school level or even many, in many respects, the college level yet. It's, a, it's basically stuck in the graduate school level of investigation. And it's going to take another 20 years for you to discover what was discovered 10 years ago. It validates that much more the reality of who God is and that He is the Creator and that there was a creation moment. When I first began to deal with some of the new things that were ultimately because of the power of mathematics, mathematics allows you to look into the future. Did you know that? Sure it does. If you know that you're going to go somewhere 500 miles and you know how fast you're going to go, you can predict when you're going to get there. You understand that? And it gets far more complicated than that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Down to uh, unimaginable things that you can't even begin to, to fathom. Some things that are even counterintuitive that you can see through the, uh, through the screen of mathematics, through the, as it were, the that means of, of, of evaluation and prediction. And through that, through that means of evaluation and prediction, men were able to use mathematical models and say, no, 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 no. This, there's, it was impossible that this happened by random events because there's so many parameters that we've defined within our, you know, f f physical life and natural world. And, and ultimately, none, there's absolutely impossible that it happened by random events. The probability of it is so far beyond the imagination that we would say fully it is relatively impossible. Like one in a hundred million chances. Are you going to go to the lottery with that? Are you going to bet your whole life on that? Are you with me? I was going to say, are you going to go to the lottery with that and be sure, certain you're going to win? No. I'm going to answer that for you. Are you going to bet your whole life on that and be certain you're going to win? You better not. You better not. You'd be very unwise to follow men in whose nostrils is the breath of life, whose imaginations are constantly changing and creating and coming up with new kinds of ideas. You're just going to be following some man's ideas because he's bright or smart or clever. But to hear all of those things that have already been done in places like Yale and Princeton and, and other great universities. Well, I mean, when I first understood what all the probabilities were going on, I said, oh, you know what's going to happen? The next big theory that's going to come, they're going to marry that with quantum logic, and it's going to be parallel universes. Because if it's one 100 million chances, then there's got to be 100 million simultaneous universes so one could occur <laughs> in an event. So, you got, so now you imagine 100 million universes existing as simultaneous, so there's 100 million alterations of yourself somewhere. You're going to go with that? Look, give me a break. Give me a break. <laughs> Look, you, you, that is just, come on. Come on now. Now we can make this more complicated, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that to you. I want to just, I want you to just deal with right and wrong, good and evil, life and death. I want you to deal with the reality that there are things that make you happy and there are things that make you sad. That there are things that cause you to love and there's things that cause you to hate. There's things that cause, gives peace and there's things that cause worry and torment and anxiety. We live in a world right now, in a society right now that produces anxiety and depression like that's never been measured or quantified before. I mean, the, the dentists say that they're making huge amount of money on these, on these teeth cars because everybody's grinding their teeth. When they're sleeping. <laughs> what a wonderful life. <laughs> All night long. Ouch. I don't have my teeth iron grind down. I'm going to go ahead and sleep the, peace of, uh, sleep the sleep of the righteous. I'm going to lay, lay myself down in peace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to be comforted. Not because of some wild imagination, some, you know, some religious 
crutch that I have because if that were true, then everybody who has religion would have the same experience and they don't. But what happens is God, through Christ Jesus, has made a way for you and I to have a miracle of life produced for us so that we begin to experience invisible things that have very tangible results. Like love, where you can love your enemies. Like joy. Where you can have, where your heart can be so filled with joy over an interaction with the living God by the name of Jesus. Just try it. Just say Buddha. Ain't nothing going to happen. Say Muhammad. Ain't nothing going to happen. Say Moses. Nothing going to happen. Say Jesus. <laughs> Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And hallelujah. Something's going to happen. Jesus. <laughs> And the more you know God, the more things are going to happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> God's given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Huh? God's given him a name that is above every name, a possibility that each person, God's not willing that anybody perish. But if you call upon that name, a miracle of life would take place. Not a religious induction into a denomination or a, or a belief system, a miracle of life takes place that is quantifiable. The condition of your spirit, the condition of your heart, your attitude, your passions, your, emo your emotions, the things that you want. Immediately, that change of heart brings a hatred for evil, a hatred for sin and iniquity, a hatred for doing those things which are wrong. I look at our society and our culture right now. We crave death. If you don't believe it, then why on earth are the movie makers making all these death films and, and, and these death features and, and programming? Somebody's paying the bill. Somebody's demanding that kind of spiritual food. People crave being, being scared and, 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 and filled with fear. Not me. I got a different heart. I don't want nothing to do with that stuff. I crave being filled with peace and love and joy and goodness and confidence and boldness and certainty. Everything that belongs to that which is good. And the Lord revealed himself. He said, here I am. I'm merciful, long-suffering full of truth and goodness. Jesus comes as the express image of the Father. And we see what he is doing. We behold his love and his compassion for people. He's going to go everywhere and he's going to fix people. You see somebody hurting, sick, disease, and they want to be, they want to be made whole, be made whole. Be made whole. Man comes, they... Some men bring one of their friends, paraplegic, can't walk, crippled. And Jesus looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven you. Take up your bed and walk. Be made whole. Everybody's all upset about the style and the form. He says, what is this? Is it easier for me to say your sins be forgiven you? Because the priest could say your sins are forgiven you under a certain, under a certain in a certain context, under certain parameters. When a sacrifice was brought and confession of sin was made. So Jesus looks at him and says, well, what is easier to do? Say your sins be forgiven you or say to a person who's crippled like this man, take up your bed and walk. And of course the answer is very clear. It's much easier to say your sins be forgiven you. But he says just so that you might know that the Son of Man that God became flesh to deliver you from the evil, this present evil world full of unrighteousness and wrongdoing. I say, take up your bed and walk. The proof that he has the power to forgive sin, 
the proof of his compassion, of his love, and his mercy. When he rose from the dead, it was the proof that he had all authority over death, that anyone who trusts in him should never die, should never die an eternal death. Because it's appointed for every man to die. Everyone, how many of you recognize that? Anybody know anybody's walk around eternal? <laughs> huh? Of course you don't. There's a moment of life. And as real as there's a moment of life, there's a moment of death. And the same God who created the life and has also pronounced the death because of men's trespasses and sins has declared to us that you live forever. God, how many of you like broken relationships? And how many of you like the thought, see, my wife and I, we belong together. Okay? And God created this thing. It's called love. I can't live without her. She can't live without me. And that got developed that way because we walk in the ways of God. We didn't allow things that were evil, strife, envy, hatred, all the things that belong to an evil world that create separation and broken covenant between people to exist in our life. As soon as we recognize it, we throw it out. We pull it, push it away. We'd say no in Jesus' name. And as a result, we were able to grow together in the right atmosphere. Huh? You put fish in the wrong environment and they'll, they'll grow three eyes. Their spines will be all crooked. They won't even be able to swim. They'll be trying to, trying to swim and, and they'll be going, to go backwards, floating, come belly up. Now you can do all, wrong environment. will mess you up in every dimension of life. You can make mice look very strange based upon the diet that you feed them. There is an environment on every level, on every micro level or macro level. There is an environment that creates results, both good and bad. People really try to pay attention to that with their health. I'm going to tell you right now, that carrot juice is going to only go just so far. Them vitamins are going to just, those omega-3s. <laughs> everybody's running around, omega-3s, omega-3s. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, the long chain unsaturated fatty acids are healthy for you. The short chains are not healthy for you. But nobody's going to tell you that. they just going to go, omega-3, omega-3. Nobody's going to buy omega-3, omega-3. Why? Because somebody said so. It's going to make me feel better. Gullible. Now God declares in his word all these good things that have immediate proofs. And people are, I don't believe that. Ah, that and who knows what right, what's the right translation? You know, men wrote that. Well, men wrote everything else you believe. <laughs> so when did that make a difference? <laughs> Hello. So, you know, when you, when you mature in that particular field of investigation in the sciences, you, you, you're constantly reading stuff and you go, where did they get this out of the Reader's Digest? <laughs> what is this? Is this a fictional, the new fictional story? You're looking at this. When you get to where you're expert at analyzing data, you go, my goodness, somebody's really pushing it hard for a grant here. <laughs> And then what's happening is whole populations and communities of people are believing this because this is the new idea. It's going to go belly up within 10 years. But God's word's unchanging. The way it worked 2,000 years ago is the way it's working right now and it's worked that way every time, ever since in between. I'm one data point that God's word is true. I stand in the company of millions and even tens of millions of people today. And some say hundreds of millions. I am a reality data point about the things of God that cannot be denied. As soon as everybody else has been born of the same spirit, had the same miracle event take place. Hallelujah. 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 I'm one of the few people that know exactly where I'm going when I die and exactly what Father's opinion is going to be about me when I stand before him. So that I am presented with him before him with all boldness on that day. Hallelujah. Because Christ Jesus, the eternal word, God's the word, the logos, the definition of who God is, the logos, the revelation of who God is, the logos, the proclamation of who God is, the logos. 
It's a Greek word that we, that we translate word. The, the unveiling and revelation and, and, and definition and declaration and proclamation and every, every, every dimension of his exact person is who Christ Jesus is. And there's no knowing God outside of him. He's the only God ever, he's the only one who's ever, God, who's ever been incarnated into the flesh. And we beheld the glory as the, the one who's the only begotten Son of God. Somebody said, oh, there's other religions that believe that. Yeah, Satan has been running interference and trying to, you know, run a smoke screen against the things of God from the very beginning. And nothing new about that. Huh? But all those religions are dead religions now. They don't exist. The events that took place with Moses are absolutely verifiable. A nation an, out of impossibility was created called the nation of Israel that then was completely annihilated and completely quit and ceased to exist. And then a miracle comes back together and forms again. And no other nation like that. Name one. It doesn't exist. You, many of you sitting here from different backgrounds, the place of your origin, and oh, if you go back, you know, five, six hundred years ago, doesn't even exist anymore. The community and population of people that you come from don't even exist anymore. Huh? You're listening to me. That's by the thousands. Don't even exist anymore. Culture don't even exist anymore. People groups don't even exist anymore. Extinct. But there's something unique about the things God's doing. Whatever has his fingerprints on it lasts forever. And it's a good thing. So, listen, God created life so that we never have to think of being separated from that one that we love. I can't even imagine being separated from my wife. My mother, when she was leaving this world, I said, I just whispered in her. I said, Mama, go to Jesus. I'll be there in just a second. Go ahead, go to Jesus. I'll be there in just a second. She gave me a little smile and left. You know, there are actually some people in this world are able to see what's actually going on in the invisible world. Some people's eyes are open. They can actually see what's going on in the invisible world. True. It's true. Just by even nature. It's true. God wants to open up your eyes, give you a spirit of wisdom, revelation, and he'll do it with you asking so that you can see what's going on in the reality of an eternal world. But God made it so, so tangible that Christ Jesus, the Word, was manifested in the flesh, whose hands we've handled, John said. We've gazed upon him. Our eyes have seen him. That eternal Word which was with the Father, that e the eternal life, the unlimited life, the life of God, the life that men lost. Here's what the Lord says. He says, until you have this miracle take place in your life, you're dead while you live. Spiritually, you're dead. And if you are spiritually dead right now, when you die a physical death, you will be dead eternally. But you'll be dead eternally where all death dwells. Because that's the righteous judgment of God. God has created a world to where that covenant with relationship with people is supposed to never cease. That I, I never have to be deprived of, of the dear relationship I have with my mother. I never have to be deprived of the dear relationship with my father, with my, with my wife. I don't have to look for a point in time and day where she's going to die <clears throat> and no longer exist, and I'll never see her again. That, who wants that kind of, a, of an existence? No way. No way. God never created that kind of existence, so he created all of us eternal. And then in the midst of that eternal, what was supposed to be wonderful and loving and beautiful and glorious, people have chosen the wrong way. They've chosen sin, and they've chosen iniquity, and they brought upon themselves the wrath of God. Somebody said, how can there be a wrath of God upon a loving God? Because he hates death. He's, he's an enemy. God is the enemy of all death. He hates death. 
He hates sin. Sin is a horrific to God as the concept of an eternal torture chamber is to us. Can anybody imagine an eternal torture chamber? That's tough, isn't it? Because that's horrific, isn't it? Well, that's just how horrific the idea and notion of sin is to God. But we can't comprehend that because we live in a world that is called it common and ordinary. And, bef and until we were changed, it was our choice as well. We lived under the influence of rebellion and God defiance and the spirit of apostasy. True. And we think it's normal. It's not normal. It's not normal. I want to read this verse of scripture to you. I got so many verse of scriptures I like to read to you. Micro word. That's the micro word. Get the macro word over here. Just a little easier to see. <clears throat> and somebody said, well, Moses' eyes, then they weren't dim. Well, he didn't have number eight font either to read. You know what I'm saying? Huh? Their characters were like yay big. They were big. My secret style of Latin. Just kidding. Someone came to church one time and go, wow, I, I've been so long since I've been in church, I couldn't understand my Latin anymore. That's actually a heavenly language. Comes right up out of my innermost being. Some people don't believe it's supposed to be in church, but God said he put it in church. <laughs> he put, placed it in the midst of the church. Let me read just a couple more verses of scripture to you, okay? I'm going to read this one here in John chapter 1. Uh, in, in verse 2 and 3. 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning was the Word. That's your beginning. And that Word, the Word that we're referring to is God, Christ Jesus. The Word, the revelation, the proclamation, the definition of who God is. Huh? And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. That life of God is a light that shines into our world right now, and it shines by way of those things that are being expressed through our life like joy and love and peace and goodness and mercy that come from an invisible realm that cannot be quantifiable. Somebody says, what's he laughing about? I don't see anything funny. It's coming from an invisible world. That's coming from the realms of the spirit of the living God that has become, as it were, a wellspring within my life, a river flowing out of my innermost being that doesn't just come from one part of my being, but from every part of my life and fills me with every expression of what it's like to be in God's presence because His presence has come into my life and my being. And that's, that, that is very reproducible. That is very quantifiable. That is the reality and the witness that you weren't born into religion, but you were born into the kingdom of God because you have in your life those things that Jesus described about those who are born by the Spirit, the miracle of life. Today, Christ Jesus is calling you to come. Anybody who calls upon him in sincerity and truth, he will immediately respond to them. The power of the Holy Ghost will overshadow you. And a holy thing will be born and conceived on the inside of you as a new creation, a new man, a new birth. Hallelujah. You get a new heart and a new spirit. You won't have the same one you were born with. Nicodemus, being the ruler of the Jews, in the right religion. Fortunately, he knew enough about the Word and spent enough time reading the Bible, the Word of God, that he was able to recognize the Word. And he said, I know that you've come from God, for no man can do what you're doing unless he's come from God. And miracles weren't just defined by the blind seeing. It's the atmosphere taking on the glory of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus turned right back to him and didn't say, he didn't say, Nicodemus, I'm just, I'm so blessed, man. I've been looking for somebody who gets it. I'm so glad you get it. Praise God. Would you like to come with me? He looks back at him and says, it's impossible for you to come into the kingdom of God to know anything about the kingdom of God until you're born of the Spirit. He comes right back at him. You must be born again. 
Oh, you mean I can't just get, I can't just get validated by some religious practice? Jesus didn't say that. You mean it's not a particular church or denomination that I ascribe to that's going to make the difference? Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say if you get in the right church and you have the right kind of, of formality and, 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 and ritual, then you'll understand this and you'll come to know this mystical revelation. He said you must have a miracle of new birth. Hallelujah. And that was be very easy to see from a Jewish context because you can look back from a Hebrew context and you can see the Spirit of the Lord coming on people at different times. The interaction of the power of God having and taking a person's life and changing them and it being a vent just like it was with Saul who was first made king. God gave him a new heart. He went from being one kind of a person to another kind of a person an instant, in a moment, not in a process. He was a salvation is a process. It, the Bible doesn't say that the salvation is a process. It says it's a miracle. It's an instantaneous, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Just like that moment in twinkling of an eye when the corruptible shall be on incorruptible. In a moment, in twinkling of an eye, you're born. You're born. People, don't want to, people today, they don't want to believe that a, that a, a zygote, a, a, a fertilized embryo is a living, is a living being. Then I tell you right now. You can't believe in Jesus. Because it's that zygote, that living zygote, that ultimately resulted in the living man. Yeah. At that very moment, he became who he was that we saw and handled and who he is today, seated at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And boy, I can go through a whole long list. Hallelujah. People want to destroy, people want to destroy children in the third trimester in the womb. That's when John got filled with the Holy Ghost, the third trimester. Huh. We want to come up with because of what they know and what they understand about the endocrine system and the, and the neuron system. They want to create all these ideas. And we know more about the universe than we know about endocrinology and neurology and biochemistry. Give me a break. Little knowledge is a dangerous thing, huh, isn't it? Makes people believe stuff that's totally false. Most people, if they took a test in a, in a university setting on the things that they believe that science espouses, you'd fail miserably. You would fail. That's spelled with an F. People banking, th banking their life on things they don't even know. Here God comes to us. He said, I'll make, I'll make this real simple for you. Here I am. I love you. I'm going to show you the Father. I'm going to show you life. I'm going to show you goodness. I'm going to show you truth. Anybody comes unto me, I will not reject them. I'll change you. I'll give you the miracle of salvation. Everything will be good. Everything will be new. Old things will pass away. Behold, everything will be new. Amen. Hallelujah. And all things will be of God in your life. If, it's not, if everything's not right in your life, it's because you are rebelling against God. Now, no one likes to say that. No one likes to hear me say that. I'm a preacher. I'm going to look at you and say, you got to change. Nobody likes saying, hear somebody say, you got to change. That sounds like rejection. Take it as you will. It's acceptance. You got to change. You got to change. In fact, we are the ministers of the message of change. Paul said like this, we are the ministers of reconciliation. Ha. Kata lege, let me help you. It means change. We're the ministers of change. <laughs> That's who we are. Change. You've got to change. And God's made it all possible through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Only he can make you different from what Paul described at the end of Romans chapter 1. And I want to go back there and I'm going to close with this because I want you to deal with it. People, we've got all these excuses. Oh, we all sin more or less every day. None of us are perfect. I'm not talking about perfect. I'm just telling you, quit being ornery. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm talking about you quit acting like the devil and cooperating with demon spirits and start getting a hold of what's good. And because and, and, God's given us every good and perfect thing. Yep. Amen. Amen. 
start le living in the perfect things that God is supplying by the Holy Spirit. You'll grow and mature in it. You'll develop properly if you get in the right atmosphere. And that atmosphere is the presence of the living God. Not the presence of hell and demon spirits and frustration and strife and envy and bickering and fussing and fighting and, and trying to get gain and selfish interest for your own gratification. Give me a break. Who wants to live that life? How many people have the same friends they had five years ago? Come on now, listen to me. You start off loving everybody and thanking the boss for the job. Inside of a year, you're hating him. Are you listening to me? What's going on around here? A whole bunch of wrong influence. That Christ Jesus has made a way to where we won't be touched by it anymore. Hi, <laughs> true. That's why Paul said we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus. Are you in the kingdom of darkness or are you in the kingdom of the dear son? Christ Jesus. That's Colossians 1.13. It's one of my favorite verses of scripture. He says if you give attendance to, to walking in the Holy Ghost and doing what's right and being those who are led by the Spirit. And Peter, of course, describes it in very practical ways in 2 Peter chapter 1. He said then an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly. You'll have great provision to understand how to step into this realm. Hallelujah. Not only now, but later. When you breathe out your last breath, you better have done some practice. You better practice entering into his presence, interacting with God. Because I'm telling you right now, the rush is on. When you're about ready, you know you're gasping and choking. For your last breath of this life. And hoping that you're right. Don't do that. That's not wise. Go ahead and receive life now. Go ahead and just start doing what's right now. Go ahead and believe it according to God's word now because there's no other word here that's going to make the difference. This word right here is finalized. That's why, see, John said, well, actually Moses said too by the Spirit of the Lord, he said, don't add to it, don't take from it because if you add to it, your name will be taken out of the, the, if you add to it, the plagues of this book will be added to you and if you take away from it, your name will be taken away from the book of life. John said the same thing at the end of the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Why? Because if you add to it, you're going to add to yourself a deception that is going to ultimately cause you to perish. If you take away from it, once again, you're going to add to yourself a deception that will cause you to perish. You should know the truth and truth will liberate you. Now don't add to it, don't take from it, just do what God said to do in a simple childlike way. And watch what happens. You'll know whether you said it right, did it right, have believed it right, because you're going to get the same results described. If you don't get the same res results described, then start over. Are you listening to me? Yes. Huh? I love to give this example, because, you know, when in, in school, you know, in teaching nursing students, and nursing students say, you know, they, I don't know what's going on with them, but nonetheless, <laughs> the, you know, so I had so many come to me with the reaction that was supposed to be purple and it was orange. And they tell me, I did everything right. I followed the instructions. I'm telling you, I followed the instructions. There's something wrong with the book. I did, this is the third time I've done it. And it always comes up this color. And so knowing what the results are supposed to be and knowing actually what the steps are, I just took the reagent and mixed them together real quick and shook the, shook the uh, test tube and said, well, why do I get this color? <laughs> and, and it's just like what the book describes. Give it another shot. Pay a little more attention to the words. But don't try to tell me that you got the right thing when you got the wrong results. Listen to me. This is your soul you're playing with. This is your life that you're making a decision about. This is much more important than your career. This is much more important than the person you're going to marry. Somebody said, well, I went over to that church and they made me feel uncomfortable about my religion. Good. <laughs> Sounds like something's going on over there. They made me begin to doubt my faith. And that wasn't faith at all, because faith has no doubt in it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> faith has the assurance. Faith has the proof. Faith has proof and evidence. Hallelujah. You're listening to me. We're here to break off yokes from off of you now. In Jesus' name, we're not rejecting anybody. We're calling all of you to come to repentance. If you've got some wrongdoing going on in your life, you need to repent. You cannot in any way make an excuse for it. You need to repent and get changed. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you become a new creation and you do things that are wrong, you need to repent.
and not allow it in your life because the grace of God has given us the ability to stand against everything that is wrong and to learn everything that is right and good, to walk in the same nature of God who's full of goodness and truth. Isn't that good? How many want to just live a life full of goodness and truth, love, no breaking, broken relationships, no more arguments, no more strife, no more bickering, no more fussing, no more fighting, no more immorality, no more wrongdoing? Sounds good to me. I'm going for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at the world. Let's look at the world. I put up a quote on my Facebook the other day from a conservative Baptist minister that said basically this. That said, he said basically that the church is the realm of heaven belonging unto God. The world, the human environment, the human condition that rejects God is actually under the realm of Satan. Therefore, if any Christian behaves himself after the fashion of the world, they, by definition, are in the realm of Satan. Thank you, brother. I mean, I, nobody knows that anymore. We believe another doctrine now. We believe that you can sin more or less every day and be right with God that Jesus died so that we can sin and it's okay. That's another doctrine. That's another Bible. There's nothing that never we're in, the, in Jesus died at Calvary's cross to take our way out of sin. He bore our sin in his own body on the tree so that now we being cut off, dead to sin, might live unto righteousness by whose wound we were healed. Because from his wound flowed his blood, the provision for redemption. Hallelujah. To cleanse our sins and wash us clean and make us white like wool with no stain of darkness or stain of sin. Hallelujah. The prophet said, though your sins be like crimson, they should be made white. Though they be stained red like the, 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 the blood of death. I mean, a lot of people, when they want to talk about sin, they want to make, you know, because the garments are white, and they want to make the color of sin black. It's red like crimson, like the stain of blood. which no dye could remedy once it was stained with crimson or scarlet. He says, I'll cleanse you. I'll wash you. I'll make you new. I'll deliver you from that unholy influence that causes all these things that my wrath abides on. And he says, there are many today that hold the truth of Christ Jesus, the truth of God, the truth of the new birth, the truth of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They hold it in a state and condition of unrighteousness, telling everybody, it's okay. God said, my wrath's on that. Read it. Are you with me? I want to get this, I want you to get this clear. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 is what I just quoted again. But here's what the Lord says. He says in Romans 2, Romans 1, verse 28, get on down to 28. He said that there was a people and that there are people that do not like to retain the knowledge of God. They don't retain the knowledge of God to do what's right. To walk in the things that are good and holy and things that belong to peace and love and mercy and, and long-suffering. Suffer, long and they, want, they don't want to retain the knowledge of God. They want to live immoral, unholy lives for self-interest and temporal pleasures. No matter who it hurts and who it harms. And nobody gets hurt as bad as the baby born without a daddy. And not wanted by his mama. Because the innocent always suffer the worst. In every situation, I'm just using one that's very apparent right now that our society is so messed up on. If we have exalted the wickedest people, said, rule over us, and they have. Out of that, then, established laws and rules that are the wickedest of all sorts for us to live under. I'm not living under wickedness. It's tyranny. Ain't gonna happen. Somebody said, What are you gonna do? You gonna fight? I said, No, I'm not gonna do it. 
what, what, what's going to happen to you? You might get thrown in jail. Fine. I'm willing to die for these things because I get promoted immediately. Well, I need to fight to hang on to this physical life. I'm ready to go right on up into glory. Huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. Nothing bad at tyranny, though. Hallelujah. People live under tyranny every day voluntarily. And here's the kind of tyranny they live under that they submit themselves to the rule of that which is evil and satanic and unholy and ungodly. And here the Lord describes the unrighteousness that his wrath is going to be revealed against that is being, being effectively active in people's life who do not want to retain the knowledge of God. And there's people sitting in churches all over America and all over the Western world. They do not want to retain the knowledge of God that He's called every man to repentance, to live a new life, to live a godly life, to walk in the spirit of holiness, to live out a life of righteousness and purity. They want to retain the knowledge of God. And He says they're given over and filled with all unrighteousness. And He describes unrighteousness. So it's detailed. Fornication. Jesus made it very clear concerning these things of how it defiles a being in Mark chapter 4, person. Paul described, he says, anybody who defiles the temple of God, God will personally destroy. And he's talking about fornication. Satan knows that. And right now, like never before, because of the internet, which can be done, used in a very good way, but there's so few using it in a good way that it's overwhelmed with every evil thing. That people now, I heard a statistic the other day that pornography, actually they're, used, they're targeting eight years old. People in, uh, that are eight years old, pornographers, those uh, pornographic uh, producers are targeting children at the age of eight years old to get them hooked at an early age, to twist them, distort them. It's evil, man. It's as evil as anything. It's as evil as any kind of murder and any kind of terrible thing you can imagine. Satan is his scheme. And many people sit in church and they participate with that which Satan is doing by participating by, at looking at pornography and thus, as it were, in bowing down to Satan and empowering him to do even more. And if they are the church, then listen to what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be the hinderer of iniquity and lawlessness. And if we're not the hinderer, then what we've done is we've just opened up the door so that more wickedness and more sin can run rampant through our society into our culture. And here we find ourselves at a time and a generation where there are not those people who stand up and believe that which God believes and stands for His purpose and His righteous cause. But we've abdicated our authority, given place and license for Satan to do whatever he wants to do to those whose eyes are blinded and hearts have never understood. Somebody's going to have to stand up and do what's right. Fornication. This is a description, wickedness, covetousness. I see so much covetousness going on in the house of God. I don't think you're supposed to covet the spiritual gifts. Not more money, more stuff, more things. Oh, God help us. Maliciousness, full of envy. There's so much envy going on. Parents pitting their child against somebody else's child, always competitive, always of a competitive nature. That's envy. That's envy. It's, a demon. it's operated in a demonic realm. Moms, you need to be boistering other children instead of boistering your own. Don't use other children and say, oh, I wish you were more like Johnny. I wish you were more like Sally. Huh? Or even the other, round, other way around. Oh, you better than all the rest of them. Huh? All the rest of that nonsense. It goes on in the church. There's no light shining, not when demon powers rule like that. Religion is full of envy. It's full of covetousness. He says, murders. Oh, I'll well, praise God, I'm not, I don't have that. Somebody finally finds something they don't have. <laughs> well, if you've got one of them, you're guilty of all of them. Are you with me?
debate. Not even strife, just debate. Just the argument. Just want to argue. <laughs> anybody found anybody like that in church? Just want to argue. It doesn't matter what you say. Oh, I want to argue. Deceit. Malignity. Whispers. Backbiters. Anytime you talk bad about somebody in any way, oh, I want you to just pray for, I want you to just pray for sister so and so because you know, my, I, I really love them, but boy, are they ever messed up. That's backbiting, whispering. It's a demonic realm. It belongs to the demonic realm. How can the Holy Ghost do what he wants to do in our midst if we're allowing the God of this world to have influence over our lives? Proud. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. Backbiters, haters of God. Oh, somebody said, I don't hate God. Well, if you don't love him, you, don't, you, you hate him. Now, don't make it that absolute. That's just the way it is with God. There's, there's, that's the way it is in the Hebrew language. And that's even the way it was. It's ultimately, even though the, uh, the Greek language has a whole lot of gray area, it's just black and white when it comes, you know, it's just clearly good or evil when it comes to the scripture. It's right or wrong. It's absolutisms. Jesus, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's his definition of love. Do you understand that? I mean, everybody's telling me how much they love God. Well, you think you love God, but your deeds show that you hate him. Well, now I'm really mad at you. Now I'm really upset at you. Now I know that you are not of God. And if we could kill you, we would try to. No, I'm just going to go with the word of God. I'm not going to play pretend. We, we, we pretend, was for, pretend was when we were maybe three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, whatever. Pretend. We're not pretending anymore. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and my Father will love you. Then my Father will love you, and we will come make our dwelling with you. And when God's dwelling on the inside of you, you're having a good time. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's days of heaven on earth. You have, power to, you have power to overcome sin. You have the faith that overcomes the world, that conquers it, that does not in any, any, in any way submit to its deceit, its lies, its deception, its, its evil workings. This is the spirit of truth who delivered us from the lie. This is the spirit of truth who delivered us from the deception, who leads and guides us into all the truth, not some of it, all of it. I'm living with him. I'm walking with him. As many, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, the children of God. I'm going to be that. I'm going to be that. I'm going to demand it of myself. Huh? Are you going to make excuse for yourself? Or are you going to cry out to God for help? Are you listening to me? You need to make excuses for yourself. You get real and cry out for God, to God for help, and, he, and he'll come help you. But if you make excuses for yourself, he can't come help you because he's given everybody a free will, freedom of choice. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgments of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, do the same, but have pleasure in those that do them. And we live in a day of covenant breaking. If there's anything that describes to me no knowledge or relationship with God is to be a covenant breaker, to break covenant with people. Now there's such, and, and, and of course, I want to make sure that everybody understands this. You know, there's people who've left this church by the hundreds. They were never going to go anywhere. I didn't break covenant with them. They left. I'm still here in covenant. I'm not going to break covenant. God doesn't want us breaking covenant. You don't have the right to walk away from any relationship. You didn't have the right to, to walk away from any relationship. Some of you here, you came from other churches. Hopefully you left those churches right. 
and you're still in covenant with those people. Huh? Maybe you had to move away. Maybe there was false doctrine being preached. Huh? You with me? Maybe they're just, you were just too shallow and, and God was really moving you because you wanted to go deeper. There's all kinds of justifiable right reasons to go from, to leave a church. There's a lot of wrong reasons, and most of them all the people leave churches over are totally wrong reasons, they're not right reasons. Because there's a spirit at work, covenant breaking. I want everybody to stand with me. I got a lot more things to say to you. I want to, I'm going to say this to your people. I, I'm, there, these, these things are so concerning to me. These things are so concerning to me. Today, People in industries that are all about making movies and entertainment, film entertainment, television entertainment, they're trying to create something that makes, it's a virtual reality for you. It makes you actually feel like you're actually having the experience. And what's going on is there's a strategic design, a satanic design to pollute the imaginations and the thinking of men so that they can throw off the truth every time they hear it. Because out of that framework of those things that Satan is designing and doing just within that one arena, People's minds and understanding and hearts are being polluted and darkened and hardened. And there's a, there's a strategic device of Satan on so many levels doing exactly that same thing over and over again, coming at you from so many different directions. You've got to understand what I'm telling you. There's only one place of safety. Just as there was only one place of safety in the ark that God had Noah built. There's only one place of safety now. There's only one place for you to run. There's only one place for you to have shelter. There's only one place for you to be protected. And that is taking it, that is hearing the word of God and giving all heed to his word to obey it, to lay hold upon it. And then knowing that in that heart of sincerity, God the Holy Spirit is going to strengthen you and help you. You have to decide today what you want to do for the rest of your life. Because whatever decision you make today will more than likely be the decision that you make tomorrow. And that tomorrow's decision, the next day, until that decision is so rooted and so established in your life, you'll never be able to change that decision. What you sow into today, be certain God will not be mocked. You will reap in the future. If you sow to the flesh today, you shall reap corruption tomorrow. In the tomorrows of your life, you will be so rooted, so ridged in a process of thinking and attitude and behavior, there will be no way out. Because every time you reject God, your heart gets hard. Every time you make excuses for wrongdoing, your conscience becomes seared. Today, decide that you're going to sow to the Spirit, that you're going to make the right decisions. Hallelujah. That you're going to give yourself completely over to walking with God today if you're not sure that you've been born of the Spirit. We want you to be sure. Maybe some of you today, you were born of the Spirit, but you backslid. And you and I both know it because right now, standing before the presence of the living God, you know if there's wrong, evil things going on in your life that you regard. You regard evil. In other words, you say and you know and you confess that it's wrong, but you, you know also that you're going to continue to do it. That means you regard evil in your heart. That's not repentance. And the result of that is going to be destruction now and throughout the forever of your, being, of your existence. Stop today. 
It's made, God, Father has made it so easy. God has made it so easy for us. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll come save you. He'll save you. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord and you've never had the miracle of salvation and been born again, he'll come and save you and work a miracle in your life today. If you've backslidden, he'll come and save you from that backslidden state and set your feet upon the right way. But believe it, it's narrow. That's the message of Jesus. And few people find it. The entrance in is narrow. It's not easy to find. That's what the Lord said. It's not easy for a man in his own self-righteousness, in his own self-examination and self-evaluation, always wanting to justify himself to find the way in. That's what Jesus said. Strive. Be anxious about entering into the straight gate, the narrow gate. For narrow is the way. You have to squeeze into it. It demands a whole lot of change. A miracle change that God has provided. If that change hasn't come into your life, the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you to come right now. He wants that change. He was calling you to come to him. And it's far more than coming up front and standing up front because I've seen people turn that into religion. Come just, you know, basically kneel down and take a whole box of hankies and, or, ne or Kleenexes and, 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 and use them up in one meeting. And there's no change of the heart. God wants you to call upon him in sincerity and truth. He wants change. The world needs a light. They need people who are making a difference. Because right now the world and the church doesn't seem to be too distinct in many ways. His church is very different. His church looks just like him, acts just like him because it's his body and he's the head of it. And the church is filled with the very spirit of the Holy Spirit filled with the Holy Spirit himself which gives life to the body without the spirit the body's dead right now in the name of Jesus with every head bowed right now and every eye closed you standing before the Lord Jesus Christ right now just as you're going to on that day you need to th make things right with him and never regard him as the man upstairs because he's not a man upstairs He's God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, the ruler of rulers. Father wants to change your life. The powers of darkness that have ruined you. The things of this world that have twisted your imagination and your mind. People that are addicted in this place to pornography and immorality. I'm going to tell you right now. That is only because you've allowed Satan to twist your spirit. Twist you. Because in a normal, natural state, you would hate that. You would have nothing to do with it. It would be repulsive to you. You listen to me. Those of you who are involved in hating people, that's only because you're twisted. You're twisted. You've been twisted and influenced by demon spirits. Because in a normal, natural state that God created you to be in, in his likeness and his image, you would think that that would be the most repulsive and unbelievable thing that you could ever do to another person. Oh God, in Jesus' name, Father, I pray right now that every person in this place will call upon you in truth and sincerity, that each person will have an encounter with you that causes them to tremble in your presence, that causes them to go beyond the mental affirmation to the depths of their heart, to where that there's nothing more important to them than doing what's right in your sight and hearing you say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your rest. That every person in here will value life more than death. Even as they value natural life, they will value spiritual life equally and even greater. Right now, Right now, at this moment, you can take the blood of Jesus Christ and be cleansed. But if it's just fri frivolous thinking, if it's just a religious idea, nothing will change. But if you, in, in, in sincerity and truth, you recognize that God's wrath abides upon sin. You know, humanism will make no place for that. It will throw it down. The spirit of humanism that people have bought in on. There is no wrath. There is no wrath. Oh, that's just old-fashioned thinking or whatever that's wrong thinking no the wrath of God abides upon sin 
everyone who participates with it will not come into the kingdom of God. You will not hear. I do not care who you are. God will not change what it is he knows. He will not change. Today, today, let God change you. Let, he wants to make you like him. He wants to make you like him. People used to sing the song in church, make me like you, Lord, make me like you. I sing, you made me like you, Lord. You've made me like you. Now I give myself to that. Not allowing anything else. This is what God's called you to do. There's a salvation ready for you, waiting for you right now. There's a change waiting for you right now. Father, I thank you right now in the mighty name of Jesus that not one person in this place rejects what you want to do. Not one person in this place rejects what you want to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Not one person rejects what you want to do. That every person in this place will give themselves to being a peacemaker in their home. To walking in love in their home. To walk, being a peacemaker in the church and walking in love in the church. Living out this glorious life. That a light might shine in a dark and sinful world. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every stronghold broken right now. Every power of sin and Satan no longer able to hold you in prison and in slavery. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Find harmony to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Just play the same chord you're playing. You don't have to figure it out. Take my will. Can you put that up on the overhead so people can sing it? Take my will and make it thine. Oh, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is your throne. It shall be your royal throne. Lord, it shall be your royal I want you to sing this with me one more time. Take my will and make it thy Lord. Oh, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is your own. Take my heart, it is your own. Oh, it shall be your own. Shall be your Lord. I believe with all of my heart that when men begin to pray prayers like this song that we're singing, that's what God responds to. He doesn't respond to form and r ritual and uh, phrases. He responds to a heart that says, I turn my life over to you, God, because he's king. I surrender to you, to the king. People want to make it phrases, sentences, certain words that you say. No, it's not that at all. It's the heart. 
the cry of the heart. Take my life. Can you say that? Can you say, it? take my life and let it be consecrated, separated, consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Lord, let them flow in ceaseless praise. All you have to do is say this with your heart and mean it, and, and things will change. There's people that are in here today. You come. And you've been around the church and you've hung around even in this place for many years and you've never really understood how to step over into the born again experience. You've never stepped over into a life changing experience where you have access into heaven. Where the joy of the living God fills you and overwhelms you and the peace that passes understanding rules your heart and mind. Today, let that be changed. For God is truly willing. Are you willing? Many people say, no, I want to hang on to my religion. I don't want to have to start all over. No, I'm not telling you to start over. I'm telling you to start new. We don't want you to start over what you've been through. We want you to start fresh, start right. Hallelujah. We want you to start in such a way that when you read the Bible, all you're doing is reading about the experience that you're having. When you read the Bible, you go, oh, that's why I feel the way I feel. No wonder I hate evil and love righteousness. If God gave me that same heart he's got. I have a heart just like his heart. He gave it to me. Wow, no wonder I feel this way. No, no wonder these things are going on in my life. Look at this. God describing to us the new man, the new nature, Christ in us. When you behold Jesus, you discover when you behold Jesus who God made you. Indeed, in action. Our Savior, the one we follow, our leader. Now, there's people here today, you've just been stuck. You have, you've been born again. You've been truly born again. And you, you know how to receive from heaven. But God wants you to know now how to under, and understand how to mature. How to no longer give place to wrong influences. But only have ears to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying. To be led, be guided by him. So I want you to say this with me one more time. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. Take my heart, it is your own, and it shall be your royal throne. From this day forward, Lord, it shall be your royal throne. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's just saying that. Just saying that with the heart of truth, everything changes. Those are the words from the heart that Father's waiting to hear. And when he hears them and they, he hears them in sincerity, Paul said in the very last verse of the greatest epistle he ever wrote to the Ephesians, said in the very last verse, he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon all of those who love him sincerely. And sincerely is very important. Today, make it so sincere. Today. Today, right now. There's no reason for your head to be hanging down. There's no reason for you to be sad. There's no reason for you to wonder. There's no reason for you to delay. Because you can once again turn your heart towards heaven. And he will hear such a prayer.
he would hear such a cry. Take my life and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. And it shall be your royal throne. It shall be your royal Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord 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 Jesus. Thank you. Father, I thank you for every person who responded with their heart here today. Who took it more than just a superficial response, but it went down to the deep, deepest longings of their heart and desire of their soul. Father, those who are not able to because they've been entrapped by religion or they've been ensnared by the cares of this life and their senses are dull of interaction with you. I thank you, Father, that in your mercy you bring change and deliverance. I thank you, Father God, that in your mercy change comes that, they, that not a single person in this place is not found in you on that day. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you to just lift your hands towards heaven because if you're sick in your body, you'll be healed right now. If you're diseased in your spirit, you'll be cured right now. You'll be healed right now. Let the Lord heal you right now. Let him heal you. That's it. Just let him heal you. Hallelujah. Just let him heal you. Just let him heal you. Just let him heal you. He's the healer. Let him heal you. Hallelujah. He's the healer. Let him heal you. There's a wonderful realm of faith that the Lord allows us all to participate in. And in that realm of faith, it, there is provision for every dimension of our life, spiritually, physically, materially, financially. So right now, you receive your healing right now. By the very presence of the Lord Jesus, receive your healing right now. There you go. Be healed. Here we go. In Jesus' name, I command you to be healed. As you cooperate with God in obedience to the Lord, that's what happens. You receive all that he provides. The Lord's also made a means by which you and I will be well taken care of so we can do the things that he's commissioned us to go and do. He tells us that if we'll honor him with our tithes and with our offerings, he calls blessings to fall upon us so that we'll have everything that we need. If he calls us all provision that come to us so that we all have all sufficiency in all things and today we want you to be able to also receive in that provision that the Lord has as you sow into the kingdom as you honor the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings watch what God will do as he blesses you when you do it in faith and you do it in consecration to him to his purpose to his will just say, Lord, I'm seeking first the kingdom. I want to do what you want me to do. I'm doing this because you said to do it, and I know I'm going to have those results that you declared that I will have. That's the way it is with salvation. That's the way it is with healing. That's the way it is with finances. So I want you to come and watch what happens. A miracle will begin to work for you right now as you come with your offering and you worship the Lord. And if anybody needs prayer for anything, he wants to pray for you, 
Maybe you backslid and you want us to pray for you. Maybe you're not sure if you're right with God. Maybe you've never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. We want you to come. Bring yourself as an offering. So just come. Just come to the Lord. Just come. Come with your offering. Come with the offering of yourself. Come with the offering of your finances. Just know this, that the Lord wants to bring change into your life. He wants to, in every dimension, as you come with your offering, Father wants to bring financial change into your life. Hallelujah. There's no reason for you to be in the same state and condition next year that you're in this year. There's none. There's no reason. Father's got promotion and blessing for you. So just go ahead and receive it. I want to pray for anybody who wants prayer. I want you to just come right now. If you got, we want prayer for anything, I want you to come. The Lord's here to touch you. Just come. Anybody wants prayer, come. Just come. Just come. You got sickness in your body. You got a need in, in your life. You got a hurt in your life. You feel that you, you don't, you're not sure if you're right with God. Whatever you have need of, God will heal you. He wants to touch you. He wants to change you. He wants to establish every good thing in your life. 